All right, we have covered the call to study and preparation. We've looked at the need for effective teaching. We looked at the need for diligent study. We've looked at the need for accurate interpretation. Now we begin the second message, the construction of the sermon. We're going to look at four things. The need for a clear outline, the need for control over the material and the time, the need for a, a powerful conclusion and a response, and the need for constant improvement and prayer. So what do we do now? We've studied the passage, we've interacted with the passage, we've meditated on the passage. Now we're going to communicate the words of God. How do we do this? Well, the first point is that we need to have a clear outline. And it, honestly, it's hard to overstate how important this is. Your job is to be as clear as you possibly can. It's not the job of the listeners to try to discern, decipher, figure out, now what is she trying to say? What is he trying to say? Be clear. In fact, I think it was uh, John Stott who said, I think this is a true story. John, someone asked John Stott, what's the most important thing to learn about preaching? If I'm going to preach and teach the Word of God. And John Stott said, there are three things you need to know if you're going to teach the Word of God. First of all, you've got to be clear. Second of all, you've got to be clear. Third, you've got to be clear. We need to aim at clarity and being clear. There are few things more frustrating than a teacher who isn't clear. It just confuses people. It frustrates people. People want to know where are you going? What are you trying to say? What are the points being made? So an outline helps with all this. It helps you control your material and, and ideas. If you don't have a clear outline, you're, the people are going to be lost, and, and you might get lost. And you never want listeners to be wondering, now, where are we? What exactly are we? Where are we at? What are we talking about? So this simple point of having a clear outline, I think, is going to radically help many of us. Now, some of you, you do this fine, and that's great. But an out, just merely having a clear outline is a practical application that is going to help many people really improve and be more effective in their teaching. So be painfully clear. Use a simple outline and walk people through where you're going. One of the thing, first things I aim for when I, whenever I'm studying a passage or getting ready to preach a passage is my outline. In fact, oftentimes my wife will, will ask me, so how's your outline coming? I mean, this kind of dictates my week. How's your outline coming? Do you feel like you've got, uh, I mean, this is my drama. Uh, do you know, do you have a clear outline? Um, and I actually keep filling in information as I'm studying, thinking of illustrations. It helps me file where to put the material, even if it's just the verses as an outline to begin with. I know where to file the information, where to put illustrations and stories depending on the verse. Now, there's a, a young preacher I've been, I was mentoring, this is a few years ago, but I was just working with him and he was teaching, he was at this time in a different church and wanted to improve on, on preaching. He was starting to preach more and just asked if I would listen to a few of his sermons and I said I'd be happy to. And he told me something interesting though. He said, he said you know, when I start preaching, I, I lose myself and I just go into a stream of consciousness. In other words, he was confessing that he's, he tends to be a rambler. Now, unless you are Charles Spurgeon, please do not lose yourself in a, a stream of consciousness. Uh, we, we, most people, including myself, don't want to hear a stream of, of consciousness and rambling. So an outline, and he confessed he didn't really have an outline or know really that he should use an outline. I said, you've got to use an outline. Use an outline. I'll work with you. We'll just look at the passage and have a clear Outline. This, it sort of reminds me of a, a story Professor Howard Hendricks told about a student in his preaching class who came to him and insisted that he had the gift of preaching. And Howard listened to him for a while and then finally said, you may have the gift of, of preaching, but none of us have the gift of listening to you. 
So again, unless you're Jonathan Edwards, we don't want to hear the stream of consciousness. Be clear. Tell people where you're at and where you're going and how this connects to the Word. And an outline forces us to do that. The outline is the bones of the message. It's the, uh, the you know, old English way to put it was, it's the skeleton of the message. Everything hangs off the bones. Now, the illustration that we want to use throughout this conference is, we've already looked at it, Ephesians 6, 18 through 20. So just using that text as an example, let's say we've studied the passage, we've meditated on the passage, and now we're prepared to come up with some kind of an outline that accurately communicates the word. Okay? So let me just take you through this outline. Now, this is actually not my outline. I'm borrowing this so I can, I can brag about the outline. But this is a great example of a good outline. Now, notice the title. You'll see this in your, in your handouts. Six Brief Lessons in Prayer. It's actually not filed into the right point, but skip ahead and see this. Six Brief Lessons in Prayer. Lesson one, always be creative in your prayer life. Now, notice it's connected to the text with all prayer and petition. So people know exactly where that lesson in prayer comes from. It comes from this verse and so on. Notice in lesson six, there's a couple sub points. Let me read it. Always be praying for missionaries and the gospel. This is a great lesson of prayer. I mean, this is a biblical principle. Well, where does it come from? That utterance may be given to me that I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. So two sub points. Pray for clarity in explaining the gospel. This is a great prayer to pray for missionaries. And pray that they will be bold as they present the gospel. And then a conclusion and a response. Now, I want you to notice something about this outline. These are parallel points. You don't have point one with three words and a phrase and a quote and then point two, which is a whole sentence, and then point three, which is just one word. You have a good parallel outline here, and people can actually see the sermon visually. This is so powerful and so helpful. They can actually see where you're going and anticipate the next point. Uh, anticipate the next point. This is a, a powerful tool to, to use uh, to communicate and be clear. So you'll have major points, you'll have sub points, and people, I can guarantee you this, an outline like this. You've already, you're already way ahead of the game. You, you, you people can see where you're going and they don't need to struggle and, and painfully follow along. Here's another idea for clarity and outline. Write a purpose statement. One idea is to have, write out the big idea. What's the main idea of this passage? That's helpful. But I think it's also helpful to write out a purpose statement. What, what do I want people to feel at the end of this message. How do I, what, what kind of action, where are we going? And in one sentence, write out the purpose of the passage. This is actually a great idea. I don't always do this, but I happened to do this last week. We're going through Colossians and we're in chapter two and in sort of a technical part of, of this letter in Colossians. And, and I, I was just wrestling with the passage and reading thinking, boy, this is really actually quite difficult to understand. And I realize if it's difficult for me and, and not clear in my mind, you know, as they say, a, a mist in the pulpit is a fog in the pew, I need to write out a statement and, and say it like three or four times. I mean, the general idea of Colossians chapter 2, you know, 16 to 23 is this. And just say it a few times so that if people get lost in the details, they at least know the main purpose and point of the passage. So what I do, and, and this may or may not helpful, maybe you've got other tips that are better than this, I don't doubt that, but here's what I do, and this may, may be helpful for some. For me, these steps sort of blend together. So Monday morning, I'll begin reading, studying, uh, and, and one of the first things I do, actually, is check with some other uh, preachers who've preached through this passage, like a John MacArthur or a John Stott or a Ken Hughes, just to see how they've broken up the passage. And this helps me just to outline, okay, these verses go here, these verses go. These are three different units of thought. And then I can add my own, you know, outline or words next to those passages as I go. This helps me, though, know where to file information. As I'm reading things, as I'm thinking of things, I know where to put the information. So that helps me. <clears throat> then I immediately start putting it into a word processor. Now, again, everyone has different ways of doing this. 
like Microsoft Word or Pages. And I'll start with two, three, four, five point outline. And eventually I'll have, in my case, again, this is different for all people, but I'll have like a 10 or 12 page outline that I'll have, which I'll eventually preach from. I'll, I'll trunk it that, keep the main points, send it to the secretary on Thursday so she can put it in the bulletin so people can have it on, on Sundays. I'll just keep developing this, refining it though, and that's what has worked for me. But remember, the main point really isn't the outline. It's the need to be clear. And outlines really help us to be clear. I want to note something else here on this point though. One of the most prominent mistakes, I think, is for teachers to not connect their material to the text. Let me give you an example of this. It's, it's sort of a, a pet peeve of mine to listen to a preacher start off with an introduction and then a story and then some comments and then 10, 15, 20 minutes later say, okay, now let's look at the passage now. I want to say that the sort of the gut reaction inside of me is, what have we been doing for the last 15, 20 minutes? Like, start off with the passage and then get to some stories. That's fine if you want to start with a story right off the bat, but let us know how this connects to the verse. Because if what you're saying doesn't come from the text, no offense, but I'm not altogether that interested in it. I want to hear what God has to say. So, so bring in the stories, bring in the life, but if it's detached from the text, it loses its potency and its power. Let me give you an example of this. We have a Sunday night uh, sermon series, which we started last year. We're going through the book of Romans, and it's been a great series, and it's a way to sort of train up other, other preachers in our assembly. And so I'll meet with these brothers and go over their sermons and make photocopies of commentaries if they don't have them and just kind of dialogue with them as, we're go as they're preparing and getting ready to preach. And, and I'll look at their outline before they, you know, uh, preach on Sunday. And this past Sunday we had a brother who was, was preaching for his third time and really did a great job. Um, wonderful eye contact, good content. Uh, he had good passion, just easy to listen to, just enjoyable, just all the makings of of a good Bible teacher. But for about the first 30 minutes, I actually didn't know what verse we were on. Now I knew what chapter in Romans we were in. I knew generally where we were at, but I didn't really know where he was getting this material, which was good, but I didn't really know how it was connected to what we were talking about. So his message was okay, but it would have been great had it been connected to the text. So make your outline as much as you can connect to the verses. And just bring people back. Look at verse 3 again. Look at verse 7 again. Just bring their eyes back to the text. So clear outlines are so essential. Clarity is just fundamental. And confusion can happen much easier than we think. I mean, my wife will sometimes say to me, you know, well, that, you know, afterwards, well, that really wasn't that clear. And, you know, naturally you get defensive and say, well, obviously you didn't know what, what the passage meant. <laughs> but I mean, if it's not clear in, in her mind, it's probably not clear in other people's minds. She's your wife. You know, she should, if anyone should understand what you're talking about, should be her. The need for control over the material in time. Let's look at the next point. <clears throat> this is where many teachers and preachers fail. And, and it, one of two things can happen. Either a person can be long-winded and maybe they don't really realize that, or they do and they don't care. That's a problem. Uh, another probably more common problem is that we prepare so much material, we're so excited about the material, but the time slips away so fast. And so what happens is we spend, you know, way too much time in the first couple points, and then when we get to the firepower at the end, we're all out of time. We've got to close in prayer. Time management is key and fundamental. Knowing how to manage your time. Uh, so we need to be careful about this and we need to practically do some things. So one thing I want to recommend, especially if you're fairly new to teaching, is to time yourself. I always tell people this. Time yourself. Practice in your, in your basement, someplace in your room. Go over your message as though you're teaching it to people and time yourself. Some people, <clears throat> it's interesting, 
Everyone's different. Some people, when they get up in front of people, talk less. They, they use all the material too fast. And some people are the opposite. They get up in front of people, they just get nervous, and they just keep going, and we've all, we've all experienced that. So we need to be careful with time. We need to time ourselves. Another practical suggestion is to write down markers in your notes. In 15 minutes, or at you know, 10.45, I need to be at point three, or I'm sunk. So you're, you're, mar you're aware and cognizant of the time, and you're moving through appropriately. Again, we want to focus on the main point of the text. So we don't want to lose ourselves in the details and then, and then not emphasize the main point or emphasize how this applies to the particular people we're talking to. So again, if, if you struggle with this or you struggle with being long-winded, I just want to say gently, you really need to practice self-control. Because truthfully, you may have the greatest message, most profound message in the world, but it's not going to be effective if you drone on and on and on. So if you want to be effective, you've got to control your time. You've got to be careful. Again, we can get so excited about the truths we're talking about, but if we drone on, it's not effective. <clears throat> All right, next point, the need for a powerful conclusion and response. This is sort of, we could say it's like landing the plane. Some people are great at taking off, just a great takeoff. Some people are great for flying around for 40 minutes. I mean, just look at the views, it's beautiful. <laughs> but then they get to the end of their time and they circle around the runway for about three or four times and then they crash and we all crash with them. So we've gotta be careful about how we land the plane. And again, this comes back to time management. A lot of times they don't land the plane because they've run out of, they've, they've misallocated the time. So make sure how you thought through, make sure you've thought through your conclusion and your teaching. Many teachers, including myself, we, we spend a lot of time on the body of the message, but we don't really think through the, the conclusion of it. Just kind of wing that part. Well, we need self-control in that as well. Thinking through what's the conclusion? How do we want to move people? Specifically asking, what does the text demand? And so we think through how we want to conclude. So some conclusions might even, or some, some, some uh, responses might include some things like a time of silence at the end, or, or singing a song, or a time of prayer. But here's the main point I want to focus on. Preaching and teaching should move people. This is, this is so important we get this. We could have all the mechanics down. Oh, just a great teacher. She is a great teacher. He's a great teacher. But are we moving people to action? We want to move people. In fact, if you don't want to move people, you should stop teaching. The goal is not merely information. People can stay at home and read Martin Lloyd-Jones. Big ones can stay at home and read good commentaries. We want to move people. We want a response from people. We want to call people. We want the assembly to do something different. We want to live differently because of the Word of God. This applies to the family. You know, if that's the fa this, applies to the, this applies to your neighbors, evangelism. We're moving people, calling people to, to action. We're confronting sin. We're, we're comforting those who are hurting with the Word of God. We're moving towards something. This is really leadership through preaching. And, and we, we need this. We, we don't want to just be expository machines that are explaining the passage. That's great. But what does it mean? We lead people through preaching. The Word of God is sufficient to address the needs of the group. And your job is to communicate that, explain it, but spell it out for them as well. Here's what this is going to mean for you and call them, and plead with them, and beg them. Sometimes I wonder if we're too proud to beg. But what attitudes should they be feeling? What, what, uh, what do you want to happen because of this gospel message? I, I think of the Apostle Paul. He pleaded with people. He was moving people. He was warning everyone, Colossians 1. Sometimes I wonder how much of our preaching and teaching lacks this. We, we have all the right ingredients, but then we never move people and call people to action. Charles Spurgeon said this. This is hilarious. 
I must threaten you, he says. You shall not have such warnings as these in hell. I mean, when's the last time you threatened someone in your teaching or preaching? Well, he was not too proud to beg people. Look, I'm, I'm begging with you. Come to Christ. Be reconciled to God. We need more of this. Professor David Hume, uh, atheistic professor, was walking, philosopher, was walking uh, on his way to hear the famous preacher David, or George Whitfield, and someone stopped him and said, well, you don't believe what he does, right? And Hume said, no, but he does. Do you believe what you're preaching? Do you believe it? Do you, do you believe it matters in people's lives? That this is eternally significant? Do we believe the gospel? Do we believe God's word is sufficient for every need? Do we believe that people will perish if they don't hear the gospel? Do we believe that? Lord forbid we don't call people to action and, and lead and move people. So when you preach the gospel, let me say one other thing in conclusion and response here. Bring it back to the gospel of grace. I think it's always appropriate to include the gospel. This not only comforts people, but it also is the power of God to those listening who may not be saved. Donald Gray Barnhouse was one of America's finest preachers. He pastored one of America's most famous churches that was been around for something like 200 years and has remained faithful to the Word of God, 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia. Barnhouse was one of the first preachers on the radio, and one time on the radio, sometime in the 50s, he told this story. He said, if Satan took over Philadelphia, his most diabolical ploy would be this. All the bars would be closed. All pornography would be banished. All the streets of Philly would be clean and filled with polite, law-abiding citizens who smiled at each other. All swearing would be gone. All the children would say, yes, sir, and no, ma'am. And all the churches would be filled to overflowing to the point that there'd be no room left for one more Philadelphia and even to fit in a pew in this vast city. The deadly diabolical danger, Barnhouse said, would be this. And it would be Satan's schemes at its most strategic point. In all of these churches, Christ would never be preached. There would be religion without Christ. There would be preaching without Christ. There'd be morality without Christ. There'd be the gospel without Christ. But my friends, in our teaching of the words of God, we need to make a beeline to Christ and call people and move people and plead with people. George Whitfield said, other men may preach the gospel better than I, but no man can preach a better gospel. Do we give people the gospel in our preaching and teaching? Lastly, the need for constant improvement in fervent prayer. There's no question that the best teachers and preachers are willing to improve or eager to improve. You listen to preachers who are excellent and you listen to them in their early years and their latter years and there's no question there's massive improvements. Erasmus said it well. If elephants can be trained to dance, lions to play, and leopards to hunt, surely preachers can be taught to preach. Craddock said, concert pianists continue to run the scales. Tennis professionals who have already won Wimbledon still take lessons. Can anyone think of a reason why a preacher should not work regularly with his skill? My friends, be encouraged, as I am, that there is much room for improvement. Can I get an amen? <laughs> There's room for improvement. That's good news. I, I've often thought preaching is kind of like the Christian life. It's like Romans 7. The, the older you get, the more in touch you are with how sinful you are. It's like that with preaching, the need for improvement. The more you preach, the more you realize how much room there is for improvement. I sincerely feel like Martin Lloyd-Jones when he famously said, I would not walk across the street to hear myself preach. 
And most of us feel like that. But praise the Lord, there's, there's room for improvement. We can improve. I'm honestly humbled that people even come back on Sundays. There's room for improvement. Every teacher can improve. But hear me, there is no hope for the self-satisfied teacher. If you are content with your teaching and preaching, there is very little hope for you. You must labor to improve. You must labor to be effective. You must labor in the study. You must labor in the Word. You must labor to communicate the Gospel. You need to labor to move people and call people to repentance. Move people and call people to lead and go out. This takes work. It takes labor. So practically, how do we do this? How do we improve? Say, I agree with that, David. Now, what do I do? Here's a few ideas. First of all, regularly get feedback from a trusted few. I think you need regular feedback from those you trust. Alex Strout goes over my message basically every week. My wife is excellent at giving me feedback, and I can usually tell if it's a bad sermon. I can usually tell if I've laid an egg. And I get home, and usually she says nothing. And I wonder if I should solicit information or not. And so maybe I'll work up the courage to say, so, uh, how do you think it went? There'll be a long pause. And, well, your heart was in the right place. <laughs> now, usually the critique is, well, this really wasn't clear. You know, you lost me here. And again, the, the tendency is to be defensive. Well, you obviously don't understand the passage. And the, no, if she doesn't understand it, most likely other people don't understand it. So get regular feedback. This is so uh, helpful and critical. Also, listen to recordings of yourself. This is one of the most depressing things known to man. <laughs> Nobody listens to himself or herself and says, wow, I nailed it. I mean, usually it's, did I sound like a dying dog? Does my voice really sound like that? I mean, did I... I didn't make any sense at all, or that wasn't clear at all. So we observe and get a, a different angle of how confusing we actually were. You know, oftentimes I'll think, in my mind, it sounded so good and so clear. In my mind, it was so clear. Well, you know, that was in your mind that that was clear. It wasn't clear to the rest of us. Third, use evaluation sheets. Uh, there's a book that came out in the last few months or last year called Saving Eutychus. Kevin's going to mention this book. There's a, a feedback form in that book uh, that's, that's helpful. And maybe you'll have something different, but that, just some kind of idea of, of the right questions to ask. And give this, I wouldn't recommend giving this feedback form to everyone, but give it to a trusted few who will be honest with you. Here's another idea. Have a, a preaching club. A teaching club. We, we did this actually last year with about eight guys. It was awesome. We called it the Sons of Thunder. <laughs> I had them read uh, Saving Eutychus, but you can read other good books. John Stott's Between Two Worlds would be good. Martin Lloyd-Jones, Preachers and Preaching. Charles Spurgeon, Lectures to My Students are all good books. And then what we did is we divided up the first part of 2 Timothy. And just, I went through and divided up the units and, and basically took it out, put it in a hat, and we literally drew passages from a hat. Then each guy... On a, you know, 6.30 in the morning, we met once a week and had some guys come. And you know, I think we did two each morning, and we had a guy preach for 15 minutes. And then we did about a 15, 20-minute review. And you've got to be gentle here. Uh, but it was good. All the, all the guys said this was good. I would encourage, would encourage ladies to do this as well, uh, to evaluate and think through what are ways we can improve. And uh, we did that for about four or five weeks. We've got to be, again, not be, we need to be careful not to hurt people or be reckless, but this is, to anyone who's willing and open and wants to improve, this is actually a great way to do it. Here's another way. Listen to other preachers and teachers. Download their messages. We live in an age that is unprecedented with getting bad information, but also getting good information. And what I would say, and Kevin will talk more about this, don't try to copy them. That's always embarrassing when, we, when you hear preachers who are trying to copy someone else's style. Be yourself. 
but learn from them. Learn how they broke down the passage. Uh, learn how they taught. Learn from their illustrations. Uh, but know yourself and know your own uh, personality and style. But there's always room for improvement and being more effective in our style. And finally, there is not only a need for constant improvement, but there's a need for constant prayer. We need to be men and women who pray. And pray about being effective in communicating the Word of God. Teaching and prayer go hand in glove. Never teach the Word of God without bathing it in prayer first. Let's face it, we can build the house. I mean, we could labor all we want, I should say, but unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. So spend some time, some time before the Lord confessing sin. Lord, who am I? I don't, I don't deserve to pinch yourself. Who am I that I even get to do this? Just acknowledge the unworthiness. Uh, but then bring it before the Lord. And say, Lord, would you move through the power of your Holy Spirit in your word? Would you change people uh, and plead with the Lord to act and move? And while you're preaching, you can be praying for people and, and, and asking the Lord to move, even while you're teaching. So before you preach, confess your sins before the Lord and ask the Lord to fill you with the power of his spirit and might uh, so that you will communicate accurately his truths. I think it was Martin Lloyd-Jones at the end of his book, Preachers, Preachers and Preaching, has a book called Unction, I want to say, something like that. But he talks about this, this need for the Holy Spirit to move, and he's exactly right. Again, we can, we can cross our T's, dot our I's, just nail the study, do all the things we're talking about. But unless the Holy Spirit captures hearts and moves people, it's all for naught. The Lord has to move. And so let's pray and beseech the Lord to move for the sake of his name in his glory. Let me pray and then hand it to Chuck. Father, we thank you for your word and the privilege it is to proclaim it and teach it. And I pray, as we've just said, that, that Lord, you would give us, through the power of your Holy Spirit, a deep, profound, life-lasting conviction that we are desperately dependent on, upon you. And Lord, that you would, through the power of your Spirit, bless the teaching of your words, anoint the teaching of your words, that it would change lives and bring glory to you. Lord, who are we? We are jars of clay. We are broken vessels. But we say in our heart's desire, Lord, may your will be done. And we want to labor towards those ends, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.